Hey, I'm in here now. I'm over here now. I'm about to fit my utility rack for the last time. Uh, just for a few more details I have to work out. The utility rack holds the battery, the water heater, the inverter, the pot, you know, you know. That goes against this wall here, against my bulkhead. That's right, I got the bulkhead in. And I'll take you on the other side to show you what that looks like. Above my head here, going across the bed span, aluminum I-beams, four inch aluminum I-beams. Lightweight, super strong, uh, no flex, no bounce whatsoever. And in the case of this van, because of the uh, mechanism that I'm gonna be developing up on the top here, I laid these I-beams on their sides. Works, I tested it, put it all together, I bounced on it, we're good. But before I put these wall panels in and set this in place, I wanted to show you a project, an idea I've been working on. Here's the big problem. Uh, when you're mounting the wall panels throughout the van, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can use a sheet metal screw, a self-drilling sheet metal screw, and moose it in. Sheet metal screws could shake loose over time. They could strip out as you're putting them in. You could pre-drill and put a sheet metal screw. Doesn't matter. They could shake loose or they could strip out when you're putting them in. So then we move to rib nuts or plus nuts. Rib nuts and plus nuts can also strip and spin when you're tightening. How many of you had that happen? You're tightening in your screw, the rib nut starts to spin. Now what do you do? Now you gotta drill it out. Either way, those options are a big pain in the beep. So what I decided to do was improve on that system. So there's a couple of different ways these panels mount. Some panels are resting on a hard surface and just need to be held against the wall. Others are actually floating on the wall, like a window panel, and may not have something to rest on. So those need a different treatment. But what I've been working on is a series of magnets. Now these were my test pieces, and look at how this works. You get this in position, right? Did you hear that? Done, done, it's there. Now, I can buy different pull strength magnets. Okay, these are donuts, right? And they're countersunk, so you can get a screw through them. And I've got some plans to go the other way. This system works. These are nine pound pull. And I've got one, two, three. I've only got three magnets on this panel. And when this sucker, gets in place, you gotta get past that silly thing over there. Boom, that's it. No rattle, no shake, no nothing. Now, of course, in the case of these side panels, I'm gonna have this rack pushing up against both sides. So it's not that critical, but I've been making some, I've been playing around with this. It's gonna work really well. I wanted you to see that. Now I'm gonna put this rack in. Let me get this other panel in. Come in behind that. Oh my God, does that get any easier? Look, it's not coming out. That's nine pound. I'm actually gonna double. Where are, there you are. I'm actually gonna double up. Uh, I'm gonna go with a 16 pound pull on these walls and then a little bit higher up on top. Anyway, here goes the rack. Now it's resting up against the bulkhead and it's resting right against my walls on either side. On this side of the van, I'm gonna have my shore power connection on the outside. But that wire is gonna come in from the rear of the shore power connection and then come through here and go to my inverter. On this side, I'm gonna have my little outdoor shower. Same thing. This is gonna come through the wall and I want it below the surface if I can get it in there. It's gonna be a little tight because of the way this chassis works. It might have to be up here. But the, the reason I'm telling you this is because I wanna put in one of those access hatches. If you've ever changed out your shore power plug, you know it could be a scary thing if you're working from the outside and you don't know what's going on behind that chassis wall. So in this case, you'll have the chassis plug mounted on the outside. 
On this side, you'll have a nice eight inch access hatch. You unscrew it and lo and behold, there's the back of the shore power connection, okay? So you can work on it either way, but you've got access, you'll know the condition of it, you'll be able to inspect it. Uh, so again, the, the whole premise to the way I build a van is that you've got easy access in the future to these components that are going to break. Not if they break, you know they're gonna break. You gotta be able to get at them. You gotta be able to fix them with a minimum amount of labor, whether it's you doing it or you're paying for labor. It's a, it's a tedious process to try to figure out how to design this stuff and make it look nice and make it work and look legit, but also have it all come apart like that. It's worth the effort. It's definitely worth the effort. Mr. Sprinter has a true appreciation for wood. He has a home shop that rivals the new Yankee workshop. Any Saturday morning, you can find him perusing the specialty racks at his local lumberyard. From his private collection, he brought in this solid cherry tongue and groove for the bulkhead in the dining room. I spent a bit of time selecting which boards to use and compose them in a manner that tells a story. A story of grain, hue, and compatibility. These boards are gonna stand alongside one another for a long time. A three quarter inch maple plywood from the same collection was used as the bulkhead backer board. The glue up was methodical. I buried a pin nail just inside the tongue of each board. This will keep the boards from hydroplaning around until the glue sets. Square to the top edge was my mantra. Square to the top edge. The next step for these boards is a very special treatment with a product called Rubio Monocoat. Yep, you read that correctly. $420 per gallon. This van will be a sailboat on the highway. While my cherry wall sets up and cures, I began to pre-cut the aluminum to finish Sam's utility rack in his garage. To avoid catching a blade tooth on your stock, you must wait for the blade to stop before raising the saw. Catching a tooth could have catastrophic or disfiguring results. I wish they put a blade break on this saw. The WD-40 acts as a lubricant and cooling agent for each and every cut. It also helps to contain and weigh down the shavings. Sawdust from wood is much more forgiving than aluminum dust. Aluminum dust on your hands, on your clothes, in your eyes, very bad, very bad. My stockpiles are full. 8020 hardware is very expensive, but it's absolutely necessary. And in the long run, worth every penny. After pre-cut, I go through a soft assembly where I can familiarize myself with the order in which the pieces should be assembled. This is also the point where any mounting holes should be drilled through the aluminum. These holes, or to allow me to fasten the assembly through the van floor into the aluminum joist underneath. Once I've got the soft assembly imprinted on the old P-brain, I align and clamp tight. I assemble everything with a hard turn on the screwdriver. Then I come back with either a right angle driver or socket to bear down and torque those connections tight forever. How about this? Almost done, almost done back here. This is gonna be the garage and I'm gonna have these four inch I-beams running all the way across side to side and they offer no flex whatsoever. Solid, rock solid. Got my microwave right underneath. 
I've got a quarter inch of space between my I-beam and my supports above the water tank. So as you can see, as I explained last time, I've completed the build. I worked out all my kinks on this side and then I just duplicated the effort over here. Uh, let's start down the bottom. These wood panels are going to be wrapped in a nice dark gray marine vinyl. Oh, I forgot my other panel. Hang on a second. Back here, uh, this will get inserted behind uh, those frame members. And now you can see I got a little uh, view hole, uh, sight tube, sight glass, sight tube. Remember the old furnace down the cellar? My grandfather used to come home every day from work. First thing he would do is tell Margaret to make him a martini. And then he went down the cellar to check the water in the furnace. Every single day when he got home from work, he'd check the water in the sight tube and take a bucket of water out, rusty water out, fresh water in. Anyway, we're gonna be filling the fresh water from an access point right over here. Uh, this van is gonna have a triple filtration water system with UV light purification. And it's gonna sit right in this trough and the trough has a drain in it. So changing the filters, removing them, easy process, no mess, no fuss. Any water you drip out gets caught in this pan and drains outside the van. So that's coming soon. That's being custom made. Okay, so the panels are all wrapped in thunder gray marine vinyl. As you can see, I've transferred the weight of the microwave, which is friggin' heavy. Everywhere this microwave touches the frame, the weight is transferred directly down to the van floor. And if you remember, I told you, I put a joist right under that part. Boom, right down. There's no bellying, there's no flip-flopping. This side, this is where my big brand new battery goes. This is a Lithionix 630 amp hour lithium. Ties in with the Xantrex Freedom E-Gen system, 3000 watt inverter. It's a magnificent system. So that battery slides right in here, the inverter, the solar controller, uh, all up there, BMS. Over here, right here, I've got just enough room for my access hatch to be able to inspect and get into the water tank. My water pump is coming out this way. My inspection hatch is right there. This area, right over the battery, I've got a support here, so I'm gonna run some supports across and probably the inverter, I'm not sure, BMS, inverter, whatever it may be, but all of those electronics take up this area here with some breakers and fuses on the wall. Now, let me bring you over to this side and show you what I got going on. We're on the other side of the van. Now we're in the living quarters. That's the garage. This area, this wall is called the bulkhead. I call it the bulkhead. It separates the garage area from the living area. And the microwave is busting right through that bulkhead. So this will be solid, probably walnut, solid walnut wall. Microwave busts through. Bed's up there. I-beam. This is my water heater. Now, as you can see, this water heater is protruding beyond the wall or the bulkhead. So it's gonna be sticking into my kitchen or my galley cabinet. See this tape? This is my galley. My galley module, 36 inches high, 18 inches off the wall, goes all the way down into the sliding doorway. You'll see that later. It's like the Vagabonds. This is sticking into that first cubby or compartment of the galley towards the rear here. And the reason for that is, I cannot flush my galley drawers right up to the bulkhead wall because when I open them, I'll hit the microwave, which is sticking into the hole ever so slightly, but it's still there. So I need to space my first set of drawers so when you open them, they clear this microwave, okay? Now that space, I'm taking advantage of it in the galley module. Rather than have dead space, I brought my water heater into that area because this first closet in the galley back here is gonna be my water closet. It'll have my water pump. It'll have all my zone valves. It'll have some filtration. All the water and plumbing originates right here. So it's gonna be very easy to access, inspect, repair, fix, replace. You know the song. My glycol 
which heats the hot water while you're driving. I gotta send my hoses up front to pick up some heat with my glycol system. Those glycol lines come right off of these and go right down. My water pump will be here to pump the glycol up front. That hosing goes right down through these channel holes in the ProMaster. This is one of the big advantages. Can you see those? See these little black, these holes, are, they, they come with these covers on them. Um, they were, they're originally put there, they're designed to take away the water, uh, any condensation that would weep and drip. These are like the storm drain canals in Los Angeles. All the water goes down on each side and exits the van through pre-drilled holes. So, they make a great chaseway for hosing wires. Be careful what you put in here, be aware what it is. You have sharp edges. You're gonna have water in the bottom of this thing. There's wax all down there. It shouldn't collect too much because there's drain and weep holes all the way down the line. But I take advantage of it because I can send my three quarter inch heater hose right down through here, right down through an existing hole, up to the front of the van, pick up the heat, bring it back up to here again and right into there. Now, there was one little trick I pulled here that I really am excited about. This water heater protrudes into where the water tank area goes. Now, you would say, why don't I just extend my support frame over under that foot of the water heater? I don't have the room to do that. There's no room for anything. You can't even store your title of the van in that space. It's too tight for that piece of paper. So, it hangs over the water tank. Not much, one inch. But I had to hang it and support it out beyond my bracket here. So rather than just put a support bracket and be done with it, I devised a system where when this water heater fails and you need to replace it for whatever reason, you loosen four screws, loosen four screws and slide this baby right back on its sled tracks, remove it, put the new one in place, slide it back, tighten the four screws down. Easy peasy. Less labor in the future. When it happens, you know it's gonna happen. So I figured that was kind of cool. Instead of just putting brackets in, I put it on a sled and I developed it in such a way that you can get your wrenches in, easy access, nobody's gonna curse. Then you bring it back into the water closet, 120 volt, and uh, you're ready to go. Now the Vagabonds have this exact water heater, and uh, I don't believe as of yet that they've needed to turn on the inverter and heat water with 120 volt uh, AC electricity because that glycol system I put in works so damn well. They got plenty of hot water for whatever they wanna do, which is good because that would have put me in hot water if it didn't work.